Did it ever happen to you that you are tired, but you can't close an eye and go to sleep? The best method I've found against this is counting charged particles. 1, 10, 11. Welcome to Kuvudu, the sorcery of copper. In this episode, we will have a look at this USB power meter, the WebU2. The idea is to use it for measuring very low DC currents over a long period of time. And for that, we will have to reverse the Bluetooth and USB communication protocol so we can directly log the values onto a computer. But first, a bit of background. I actually want to build my own weather station. Sure, it will measure temperature and humidity, but only these two things are very common. and this wouldn't require us to build a dedicated weather station. We want to make it awesome. So we will also measure the barometric pressure, the number of particles and their size in the air, but we will add less common things like the number of lightning strikes and the radioactivity using the Geiger Muller counter. The issue is that the weather station would be mounted at a remote location, to be more precise on a rooftop. There I don't have any electricity plug where I can take the energy from. Sure, I can use a battery, but this would only hold for a couple of days. I need some other energy source, and since it is on a rooftop, the most obvious one would be a solar panel. Such a tiny solar panel can provide barely enough energy to light up an LED at night while it is charging during the day. We need something larger. This panel claims to be able to deliver 20 watts, but this is the maximum at a very specific load and when the sun is going supernova. To quickly test and get an idea of what the absolute maximum is, you simply measure the voltage when it is in open circuits and multiply it by the current when it is in short circuits. But in real life you will get much less. And because I didn't believe in this marketing bullshit, I wanted to measure myself how much power do I really get and will this energy budget be enough? In a previous episode I created something very similar, the spark abacus. This also was to measure the energy, but that was for very high voltages very high currents and for AC. And for that, I could use DIN rail energy meters. Now we want the inverse, very low voltages, very low currents and for DC. And somehow for this application, there are no off the shelf standard devices. When it comes to measuring low DC voltages and currents with a bit of precision, I immediately think about multimeters. The problem is that they're designed for humans and we don't want to sit next to it for hours and note down the measurements by hand. Luckily, some multimeters come with a communication port, which allows you to connect them to the computer and read automatically the measurements. The next problem are the batteries. You'll have to change them every couple of days. I recommend using rechargeable ones. Some of them even come with an integrated USB port and charger. To further improve the usability, I even drilled a hole in the case so I don't have to open it every time I want to recharge it. But who would want to dedicate two multimeters for a long period of time just for this task? It's just too expensive and impractical. We need to find another solution. Looking around in my flat, I found something a bit more appropriate. This USB power meter. Normally it's used to measure the power consumption of USB devices, but it is capable of measuring low DC voltages and currents. This is a clone of the RDTEC UM24C, and it even offers a Bluetooth interface. Normally you would have to use the vendor provided app to remotely read the measurements, but somebody already reversed the protocol and we are now able to log the values directly on the computer. The problem is that it takes power from its USB input port and when the voltage drops below 4.3 volts it just shuts down, so we cannot use it to measure very low voltages. But also, to operate it requires a bit of current and it actually doesn't measure the current it uses. It needs around 20 milliamps, which is already quite significant when we want to measure very low currents, so we cannot use this device. Meanwhile, I found this USB power meter, the WebU2. Well, meanwhile it has been rebranded to Vitran U2 and now it is actually called QA U2, but I'll still use the name WebU2 and I mean all of them. The name is just a branding issue. Now, if we connect it, we already see the first advantage. It has four digits after the decimal points, while the UM24C only had three digits. And this is even true for the voltage, where the UM24C had only two digits, here we have also four digits. So the resolution is really high. Now, if we connect the next one, we will see that it does draw around 45 milliamps. 
And this is more than the UM24C, which uses 27 milliamps when the screen was on. But it has a crucial advantage. Here on the top, you see it has a micro USB port. And if I connect the micro USB, tac, you see it stops drawing energy from this USB port, from the main USB port. And I can even disconnect it. And we can see that it is still on. So instead of using the power from its U input USB port, it is now using power from this micro USB port. So this is really good because we can now measure um, currents of voltages below 4 volts and we can measure precisely the volt, the current which is going in here without this device interfering. So this is good. The WebU2 also provides a Bluetooth low energy interface and there is an app to connect to it. It is not very stable, but at least it works. Let's have a look at what this PLE device offers. For that, we will use the Linux Utility Bluetooth control. First, we have to power on the Bluetooth adapter in our laptop. Then we start scanning for Bluetooth devices. And if we list the devices it found, we here find the U2 or U2P in this case. A BLE device is a GAT server. And if we look at the infos, we can list the services it provides. Some services are standardized, like this generic access profile. This is actually also where you can find the name of the device. But here we can find any standardized service which would indicate us how the data is transferred. There is only this unknown service, FFE0. Now let's connect to the device and have a closer look at the GAT attributes it has. We are only interested in a service with the UID FFE0. A service has characteristics. These are actually the endpoint you exchange data with. And we see it has only one characteristic with the UID FFE1. Characteristics can have descriptors. And here we can see that it has the user description descriptor. If we connect to it and read the data, we can see that this characteristics is responsible for Rx and Tx. So this is probably the right one to exchange data. If we select the characteristic and read the data, we can see we get some data, df, but only that. But I remember having seen these IDs somewhere already. Here, on the HMSoft device, let's list the attributes. And there it is, service FFE0 and characteristics FFE1. This device is currently broadcasting the HMSoft name and it is just a standard BLE module. This is the HM10. The datasheet also lists these UIDs as the default UIDs. You can configure it using AT commands. This is also how I changed the name. You can then use it as UART to BLE converter. You just connect serially to it and then you can read the data over the air. In Bluetooth Classic, there is this SPP, Serial Port Profile, which does exactly that. In BLE, there is no standard profile for sending serial data. This is why they use this unspecified UIDs. And if we take the U2 apart, we can also see that it uses a standard BLE module. And it is connected to the main board using four pogo pins. Once we identified ground and VCC, we can hook up the probes to the two other pins. And looking at the oscilloscope, we can see the data traffic. And we can recognize it is UART. If we look at the smallest pulse, which is one bit, we can identify the board rate. We could hook up a logic analyzer, but we already know it is serial. So instead, just use two USB to UART converters and connect the RX to each of the pins so we can monitor both directions. Let's connect it to the computer and have a look at the communication. First, we have to set the serial configuration. And now we can have a look at the data. Let's start with the line from the Bluetooth module to the U2. And now we can see the data. We see two kinds of packets one which is a bit longer and changes all the time and one which is a bit shorter and always is the same. To help with the decoding, I wrote a small script. As input, it takes the two serial streams. It then formats and shows the data. Now to reverse engineer a protocol, you will spend a lot of time staring at bits and bytes and trying to make sense out of it. But at some point, you get used to it. I don't even see the code. All I see are blonde, brunettes and redheads. Let's stop the stream and have a closer look. First, we can see a rough pattern. This data is not random. Some values are constant. This indicates that it is not compressed or encrypted, which will ease the decoding a lot. Looking at the exchange, we recognize some data from before, namely 
these values. Every time the app sends this message, which is indicated by this arrow, the U2 will reply with a couple of other messages, or uh, with a couple of measurements. As soon as the app is closed, it will stop sending these messages, and after a couple of seconds, the U2 will stop sending measurements. So we first know that this is kind of the keep alive. As long as this is sent, the U2 will continue sending measurements, which will be very important if we want to implement our own decoder or our own application. Next, we can see that the data is repeating every 20 bytes. And this is how I represent the data. We will call these messages or packets. Each message starts with the value FE and ends with the value 00. zero. So message, this is the message header and this is the message trailer. After that, we see a number which is incrementing and looping around. One, two, three, four, and so on. And this is ev each message is sent every 10 milliseconds and then it loops. This is very probably indicating the message type, which then will tell the application how the data inside is encoded. Let's just filter message type 3 as example. Here we can recognize that something is incrementing every second. Actually, these two values are incrementing every second. To be able to decode data, we first have to know how values are encoded in computers. We all know data is stored in bytes or 8 bits. But how are the values encoded in these bytes? Well, natural numbers like 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on are simply encoded as integers. This is what we see here. Every second, the hexadecimal value increments by 1. Hexadecimals are just a very convenient way to represent bytes because two hexadecimal values form one byte. One byte can hold the values from 0 to 255. 0 in hexadecimal 0 and 255 is FF. Once the value goes beyond 255 or FF, it starts back from 0. And here we can see that the next byte is incremented by 1. And this keeps track of the overflow. 2 bytes can store values up to a bit over 65,000. And very often values are stored into words of 4 bytes or 32 bits. When we talk about 32 or 64 bit machines, this is also what we are talking about. The data size the machine is able to process at once. What is curious is that the next byte is incremented. We are used to read values from left to right. 1234 is read as 1234, where 1 is the most significant number with the most weights, 1000, and 4 is the least significant number. This method of reading data is called Big Endian, but most computers actually use the Little Endian method. There the first byte is the least significant one, and this is why the next one is incrementing. Now values are stored into groups of 2, 1, 2 or 4 bytes, and this is very probably either in 2 bytes or in 4 bytes. And the next group of 4 bytes actually restarts with the least significant number being left. Another way to figure out how data is encoded and where it is encoded is by changing the values the device measures and sends. For time, we didn't have to change anything since it passes on its own. Until now, we didn't find any way to stop it. If we change the voltage, we see that this data is changing. If we change the current, we see that that data is changing. This is not incrementing like the integer we saw for the seconds. Numbers with a decimal point like 4.5 volts are actually encoded as floats as opposed to integers. The encoding into bits is a bit more complex, but we don't really care. All we have to know is that it doesn't look like integers. The computer will take care of it. We just have to tell this group of four bytes should be one float number. Please decode it. Now we can extend our little script and test our assumptions about the encoding. We will quickly see if the decoded values make sense. And it seems to work fine. All that remains is to repeat this process for all the other messages. We can also simulate the device. We do have one of these UART to BLE converter. So let's pretend to be a web U2 and the app seems to be happy with it and can connect to it. So now we inject some data. Here we can see I've injected the voltage 4.242 and the amps 
2.323. So injecting these values work quite well. We can also fuzz some bytes, so injecting random data. Here you can see on the bottom right, the time is not actually incrementing every second. This is because I'm incrementing the second value every time I send the message, and this is around every 100 milliseconds. And if I tap enter, I can actually fuzz the next byte, and we see the time passes even faster. Let's continue, the time goes now crazy, and if we start fuzzing the fifth byte, we see that the next value or the next word is fuzz. This is the time just below the first one. This allows us to fuzz any byte in all the messages and see on the output what the corresponding value is actually. This also shows that there is no checksum in the message which the app could use to verify its integrity. This is because I'm only fuzzing one byte and if there would be a checksum somewhere else in the message, the app would know that the data is corrupted. And since we don't want to hook up the USB to UART converter on the device all the time, let's use the Bluetooth interface. And I have to say that communicating with a Bluetooth low energy device using POC was really hard, even harder than reverse engineering this protocol. But let's try it. And once it is connected to it, it decodes all the data. And we can see that if we change the current, we see the current increasing. So this works quite well. And since we implemented the program ourselves, we can do whatever we want with the data and easily log it. Because I want to be able to read very low currents and voltages, I need to power the WebU2 using its additional USB port on top. And when we connect it to USB, we can see that it pretends to be a human interface device. This is a standard USB profile used for mice and keyboards. But in this case, this is simply used to be able for the application to communicate with the device without requiring any USB driver. There is a Windows software for it, and this is what it looks like. And it reads the data over USB. Surprisingly, it can only read data over USB and not over Bluetooth. To monitor the communication between the application and the device, I use the software called Wireshark. This is a software normally used to monitor network traffic, but it also supports monitoring USB traffic. And if we click on a packet, we see that it is for an HID device, and then there is data at the end. This is actually the data which is exchanged. Here again, we use the same principles to find out which bytes encode which values. Surprisingly, the protocol is completely different from the Bluetooth interface. Instead of having 20 bytes per message, here we have 64 bytes. The header is different, it's FF instead of FE, and here we don't have an ending or trailing byte, here we have a checksum at the end. It doesn't have any message type. It doesn't also send all the measurements. For example, over Bluetooth, you could read the capacity or the energy which has been sent and the recording time. Here, you only see what is shown on the application. The voltage on the USB bus, on D+, plus, on D-, minus, and the current, but that's all but this is perfectly fine for our needs. We just have to implement the decoding in our software, and there it is. Now we can read the measurements over USB. It also allows to print it in a CSV format, so we can export the data and process it using any kind of software or script. I've also implemented that it sends the data over the network to an InfluxDB time series database, like I did with the Spark Abacus. This will be our experimental setup. Here we have the solar panel and it does have a 12 volt output, but it also has a 5 volt regulated output. I have no idea what's inside and how this regulator works or how efficient it is, but I'll still use it. Then we have our WebU2, which will measure the voltage and the current, which passes through to this module. This is a battery charger based on the TP4056 and it is there to charge the lithium polymer battery, which will provide energy during the night for for the whole weather station now for the way to simulate the weather station i simply use this load which is just a bare led and we can put it here so this will simulate the weather station and also it will constantly drain some energy from the battery so we can actually charge it all the time and monitor how much current or how much energy the solar panel is able to deliver to visualize the data, I then use Grafana, which connects to the InfluxDB to read out the measurements. And this is what it looks like. So we can see 
the voltage over one day and the over one week and the current over one week and we can clearly see that the sun starts to appear around 10 o'clock and then sets around 7 o'clock currently and with the the current we can see how bright the sun is because the brighter it is the more uh, the higher the current will be for charging the battery i didn't care really about seeing where what the brightness of the sun is what i did it for was to figure out what my energy budget is and this is what is shown actually here this is the average of the currents over one week. And since I will use a low dropout regulator to have the 3.3 volt out of the lithium battery, I have an energy budget of 24 milliamps. This is not a lot. During the day, it could be 116 milliamps, but over time, when there is no sun and so on, it will be 24 milliamps. Now I would have to be very conservative when doing the measurements on the weather station, or I can use a better solar panel or tilt it better, put it on the roof, use an MPPT, a charger and so on. But it gives a rough idea of the energy budget. And that's it actually, the project is now finished. So enjoy. Here, a weird behavior that took me quite some time to understand. When we connect the U2 to the USB port, we see that to operate, it draws around 45 milliamps. But if we provide power using the micro USB connection on top of the device, then we can see that it doesn't draw anything anymore from its main USB port. And if we connect the UM24C clone, we can see that after a power up sequence, it draws around 21 or 22 milliamps. Now pay close attention. When I connect the WebU2 to the UM24C, then we see that the UM24 reports that the WebU2 draws around 20 milliamp. But we have already shown that when it is connected to this auxiliary USB port, it doesn't draw anything from the main USB port. And if it would draw something from the main USB port, why wouldn't it use 45 milliamps, which it normally requires? And if you look at the first WebU2, then we can see that everything behind it still draws only 21, 22 milliamp, only the power required by the UM24C and nothing required by the WebU2. Side effects like these can really ruin your day and all your measurements.